I just saw a uh, an explanation of why dogs always want to be with you when you go to the bathroom. You, may, if you haven't had a dog, you may not know this, but they're often like scratching at the door or like posted up outside the bathroom door. And it turns out that wild dogs and wolves. That's a vulnerable time when you're going to the bathroom, so they protect one another.、Mm. They're looking out for one another. Oh, exactly. That's the that's, that's the right、amazing. reaction. Yeah, that's really special and interesting. I've never heard it described that way. I mean, you know, for 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 men, you know, peeing is something they can do standing up, which means that they also can run real fast. You know, for those of us who cannot. Pee standing up and have to like squat and pull down the thing and get the thing. It's like, it's it is a more vulnerable thing if you're hiking or you know. I mean, that's just like a fact of life. You want to be able to run as a human. You could be eaten <laughs> by a mountain lion. I'm always afraid that something will happen if I'm peeing in the woods. I don't think that people who stand and pee have the same kind of fears. But Jonathan, do you know the most common time for women to naturally go into labor? At night. That's right. At night, under kind of like cover of darkness, which sounds scary, but is also in many ways protective because you're not, you know, kind of out in the open. But I was wondering, you know, when when a woman goes into labor, you know, like, and if I mean, I'm a person who had a home birth, so like I think of like my cats were there, it's like a whole thing. But I wonder if people with dogs. Have this experience of the dog knowing, like, oh, they're in a vulnerable place. <laughs> like, this lady's gonna be dealing with this for a minute. I'd better stay close by. I'd love to hear from people who had a home birth and have dogs. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's gonna break down. It's a breakdown. She's gonna break it down. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik. And I'm Jonathan Cohen, and welcome to a very special Thursday breakdown. Today, Jonathan and I are going to do something that we weren't sure would do well, and apparently, y'all really liked when we did positive news stories. We have a very special set of positive news stories today, most of which are also super aligned with what we do here on the breakdown, which is talk about mental wellness and sciency things and how sciency things relate to our life. So. Jonathan, I think we should get into it. Yes, let's go. Let's be positive. The first thing I'd like to talk about was a really cool news story, actually from a couple years ago. But there's a lot of research in this field that is ongoing, and actually, a friend of mine is a professor at USC, and she she studies aspects of this. So I think we should talk about it, and I think it's especially appropriate for me and Jonathan to talk about as we're in two different places, trying to communicate and interact and sync up both. Technically speaking and metaphysically speaking, brains syncing is a thing as people interact. So this was a study that was done, and it utilized、um, things like MRI, which many people have heard of, functional MRI,、um, and EEG, which is electroencephalogram, and、um, Also using infrared spectroscopy, which these are all just different ways to correlate what's going on in people's brains when they're interacting, and we can observe these things when we put them in these fancy, super expensive, gigantic magnet machines. So what they discovered was when people were cooperating across tasks, parts of their brains kind of lit up. It's the way we kind of talk about it in layperson's terms.、Um, And there were ways that that oscillations in the brain aligned when people were cooperating for tasks. My, let's extrapolate what being wired for connection actually means, because this experiment is actually showing, you know, what a lot of people talk about, but maybe haven't had scientific evidence. Like the bad version is. You're around other people who have an accent, and you start to take on the accent. Like when you were talking to anyone in New York, you become a New Yorker more than you already are, and so you're like wired and you're mirrored to fit in and to be accepted by the group. So, and you know, we know that children, for example, we talk about mirror neurons with babies,、uh, where they're you know observing and taking in their caretakers or their caregivers, and they're trying to mimic. 
So let's extrapolate what this means, you know, in everyday life uh, that may be happening in a way that we might not be aware of. I mean, first of all, gold star to Jonathan for dropping the mirror neuron system like it's like a, a thing that everybody knows about. But um, what what some of the kind of most incredible research surrounding this kind of sinking um, has revolved around is um, not just the concept of mirroring, which I think we all, you know, kind of can relate to like, oh, like, you know, I act like you and we're together or like Madonna takes on people's accents. And, and it's the <laughs> acting class where you right, put your the hands. Right, literal mirroring exercise. <laughs> yeah. The mirror neuron system is a, a network of groups of neurons, which are the cells of the brain and nervous system. And um, there are certain regions of the brain that connect and communicate in ways that indicate that uh, the brain essentially has a template for deeply connecting with others in ways that make for a complicated integrative experience. So it's not simply I act like you or I want to be around you. The notion is that our brains have a template for cooperation, for collaboration, and ultimately for really complicated connection. So I think what what Jonathan is referring to also is like sometimes you'll you'll be with someone or especially if you're in a creative arena or if you're a musician or something like that. And it's like, oh, we're really vibing. Right. But the idea is that there are certain situations that we can put ourselves in that our brains literally want us to succeed in because it's evolutionarily beneficial. It's kind of like every science news story that we talk about is going to come down to this for me. Like we, we are finding evidence now for things that evolution has known about. We do better. And I know that there's people like, but I like to be by myself. Good for you. That's great. There are many cultural reasons. There are many individual reasons why people may seek to be by themselves. And, you know, even in primate groups, you see there's that like one chimpanzee who just like hangs on the outside. He doesn't want to talk to the other kids. But generally speaking, by and large, we are social creatures. And, you know, studies like this, studies that look at the mirror neuron system. And if you're interested, like, look up anything about the mirror neuron system it is fascinating. You know, a lot of the original work, of course, was done in primates. And actually, some of my undergraduate thesis work, I actually studied the mirror neuron system. And it's a lot of monkey research that you read. Um, but what we do know is that in particular for primate brains, you know, that are so socially connected, that's what this system is there for. Let's talk more about why is it advantageous to be able to sync like that. So you talk about musicians, you know, amazing musicians, they're collaborating, they have to almost read what the other person is doing before they do it. And there is a level of anticipation where they're like, they know where it's going next, especially in, um, you know, jam bands or uh, improvisation. Athletes, they can be also in the same uh, vein where you're trying to work together. For team sports, you mean? Team, any type of team sports. Um, if you've like doubles pickleball and you just know where your uh, partner is going to go or I was playing yesterday and all of a sudden you got to switch sides quickly and the person is communicating. You kind of are on the same flow. Um, where else does that, you know, create this level of flow state or being advantageous as an evolutionary advantage? Well, I think we've all had experiences and I'm not a great doubles pickleball player. Um, you know, I, I tend to your mirror neuron system is a little broken. But I was I was just gonna say, there's there's definitely something to like, you know. Sometimes you enjoy, let's say, playing music on your own, but when you try and play with other people, like there's not that syncing. It doesn't mean you're broken, but if you think about that, all of these systems are designed again for evolutionary purposes. You think about, you know, take yourself out of this culture, take yourself out of a place with microphones and cars and AI and whatever, and like put yourself back in a state of nature. And think about, especially before we had, you know, verbal communication, right? I mean, if you believe in evolution, <laughs> stick with me. Uh, there are there are ways to communicate, especially when you're hunting, uh, even when you're playing, which is really just, you know, simulation of hunting. Um, think about hunting. You can't be like, yo, it's over here, woolly mammoth. It's like saber-toothed tiger. It's right here. So nonverbal communication is incredibly important. 
you know, body communication, which has to be perceived by another, you know, another being, that's incredibly important. So that's like, that's sort of the system. That's the template. And then add on to it, like culture, religion, the patriarchy, you know, add on everything. And then you get us acting out different aspects of survival and intuition in the world that we're living in. And I also like, I can't help but think about like the social implications of, you know, musicians and how that's attractive. And a lot of people want to like date a bad boy. I'm like, whatever that means. But the notion also that these kinds of skills are still kind of often what determines kind of social standing, especially with athletes. It makes me think about the matrix, of course, which is that we can plug in in a way or we have sensory perception or there's an element of us in this current state with microphones and technology and AI that we may not be harnessing, which are our inherent human um, skill set or wiring. And, you know, we've sort of moved away from that. So when we lean into it and recognize that, it also is really important to think about, like, have you ever been around someone who is like really upset? And it's difficult to be around them as, you know, we have empathy, we're wired for that empathy and that connection. Um, so, you know, I think about my 15 year old and the saying that, you know, you're the amalgamation of the five people closest to you, or, or you're a reflection of that, is that, you know, because we have these, uh, we're wired for this type of connection, we do have to be aware of, you know, what are we mirroring? What are we around? What, what states are we uh, potentially connecting to. I think it's also important to realize that just like we talk about highly sensitive people, right? HSPs, we talk about people with different capacity for kind of tolerating uh, other input or other stimulus and other stimulation. Um, this is a, a great example of the specificity of each individual's brain. There's still enough specificity, right? to make us interesting and different. And if you, you know, have studied evolution at all, what you probably remember is that every evolution comes from a mutation, a change, something that was outside of the realm of what had been. That's the only way that we can kind of have progress and grow. So, you know, for people, for example, who don't have great vision, you know, if you're if you're a, a, a male person or a male-oriented person, if you don't have great vision, you probably wouldn't have been a successful hunter. You'd be like hanging with the ladies, making baskets. Like it's a thing that would have happened. So there's also all this variation in people's skill sets and, you know, where people fall. And there's always going to be differences. But um, I don't think we should go around bragging like, I've got a really good mirror neuron system. <laughs> like that might set us up for problems. Jonathan, let's tackle... Let's tackle ayahuasca next. We're going to do it. Speaking of extra sensory perceptions, let's do some ayahuasca. The Guardian just published earlier this year, Psychedelic Brew Ayahuasca's Profound Impact Revealed in Brain Scans. So um, this is not uh, me and Jonathan telling people to do ayahuasca. This is not us telling you that it's the only way to have a life or creativity or insight. But... There are people who are studying the brain on um, DMT, which is um, dimethyltryptamine. If you'd like to know, that's actually the compound that's found in um, ayahuasca, which is from a flower, and it's an Amazonian drink that is used very specifically in indigenous communities, but has now gained, of course, popularity among hipsters and seekers and everything in between. Which is different than when Chelsea Handler talked about licking a toad. <laughs> well, licking a toad is something that there are, yes, there are certain toads you can lick to have uh, very strong specific experiences. But um, this was a study that, it was a small study. And I like to, to make sure that we point this out. Most of the studies that we talk about, unless I say like, this is a study analyzing a thousand different papers or a thousand different subjects. Um, this was a small study, but it's important, especially if it comes from a university that has uh, a lot of rules and restrictions around not being able to lie around data. So for example, the Imperial College London, um, uh, Chris Timmerman was ahead of this research group. They recruited 20 volunteers and they got an injection of DNT and a placebo. And then they used electroencephalography and 
functional MRI. So again, you're going to hear these two things. That's pick, picking up uh, electrical impulses that are taken from the surface of the brain and putting people in a scanner, uh, an MRI machine, which you may have had for a knee or a shoulder. But functional MRI um, allows us to look at blood flow in the brain. It's a gigantic magnet, and it basically upsets all the magnetic things in your brain. And uh, we can measure that as a measure of blood flow. Anyway, um, they recorded brain activity before, during, and after the drug took hold. So I'll, I'll sort of break down the, the main findings in layperson's terms. So the, the brain has a, a hierarchical structure and organization that we sort of can measure, and that is measured usually by collapsing a lot of different images and saying, like, what does the sort of structure look like and what does electrical activity look like? And when a brain is on ayahuasca, um, this electrical activity becomes um, <laughs> anarchic. <laughs> that means like there's a little bit of anarchy. Um, but certain connectivity between regions that don't normally communicate very actively um, gets activated. So we're seeing more connectivity between the kind of regions, again, that um, that lead to a notion of like higher awareness. Um, imagination, you know, uh, having an intense experience on these kinds of drugs. Um, it, it's very common for people to say, like, it was really, really intense, right? And the reason is not necessarily because, like, magic is coming down that has no explanation. The explanation is there's there's things happening in your brain that um, are producing a lot of flow, and a lot of connection between activities that don't normally communicate that way. So what a lot of people will report is feeling like they have deep understanding of things. Um, this often happens also when people have mushroom experiences, like everything became so clear. That's my favorite thing that I hear people say, like, it was so clear. It's like, yeah, because like literally a lot of your sensory input is being dampened so that others can be heightened. But yes, it's very, very clear. And then you reread your notes the next day. <laughs> um, there's also, um, there's also indications that, you know, regions of the brain that normally would inhibit kind of, um, Im imaginative and creative thinking that in your daily life would not make it easy to function. Those parts of the brain that normally inhibit are kind of released. Um, and they're released for a period of time so that you can you can experience things that are dreamy and fantastic and outside of the realms of your normal understanding. Um, and, you know, I think that's that that release of inhibition is evident if you've ever, you know, had half a glass of alcohol, you know, um, or, you know, really any kind of experimental medication um, in more so than kind of, you know, over the counter things, which tend to have a different mechanism. Um, but that's that's not not an unusual report. So this is kind of me being like boring, mean scientist lady who also is 47 years old. So yes, there are profound experiences. And I'd like to point out that indigenous communities that utilize ayahuasca um, do so in a completely different cultural construct than we do. And even if you go to the Amazon and even if you're going and it's an authentic experience, which if that works for you, that's fantastic. Um, you do not have the structure of a culture that receives information the same way as cultures that are raised with an indigenous consciousness of ayahuasca, the way the world is structured, the way the universe was created, how you receive information and how you process it, which is not to say you can't enjoy it and it can't be transformative. And a lot of people report tremendous breakthroughs from trauma and depression. But I just want to remind you that you know, going to a place and being like, I didn't speak Spanish, but I still got it. Like, that's amazing. And also, ayahuasca exists in indigenous communities in a in a very sacred and specific way that, in my opinion, we don't just get to be like, knock, knock, I'm ready. Tune in next Thursday when Mime does ayahuasca, discovers the secret of the universe, and magically starts speaking Japanese. Anyway, Jonathan, do you have anything else to say about my report of this study from Imperial College London? <laughs> nope, I think you summed it up, and I'm excited to do the documentary where you go to the Amazon. My Ambiance Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. 
We've all had times in our lives where we have felt absolutely uncertain about where we're going. And I am no exception. Sometimes I'm faced with tough choices and I just can't see the path forward. It's not clear. Maybe you're the same. Maybe you're dealing with a decision around your career or your relationship or anything. Well, I have found that therapy helps me stay connected to what I really want so that I can navigate life and move forward with confidence and excitement. I cannot live without therapy and I don't want to. Therapy helps me trust myself to make decisions that align with my values, and that's what it can be for. The more you practice, the easier it gets. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's online, it's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You fill out a brief questionnaire and they'll match you with a licensed therapist. You can switch at any time for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Go to betterhelp.com slash break today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. Mind Be Out's Breakdown is supported by K-12. As a parent, my focus has always been to empower my children to succeed now and in the future. K-12-powered schools can help your child reach their full potential and give you the support you need to get them there. You need to check them out. K-12-powered schools are accredited, tuition-free, online public schools for students in kindergarten through 12th grade designed with an engaging curriculum that supports individual learning styles. With K-12, learning is personalized and provides the flexibility your family needs. When school can be anywhere there's internet access, they can learn at their own pace in their own place. Jonathan and I have loved learning about K-12 and all of the incredible opportunities that they provide. As someone whose kids have been homeschooled their whole life, I love K-12 and they're really changing the face of online learning. K-12 powered schools have state certified teachers specially trained in teaching online. They utilize hands-on innovative technology to make learning interactive. K-12 powered schools even offer social opportunities, extracurricular activities, and even in-person events. K-12 has more than 20 years experience helping students gain the skills they need to thrive in the future. Join the more than 2 million families who've chosen K-12 and empower your student to reach their full potential now. Go to k12.com slash breakdown today to learn more and find a tuition-free K-12 powered school near you. That's the letter K, the number 12.com slash breakdown. K-12.com slash breakdown. Let's go to a different kind of brain study that doesn't involve drugs, likely won't send you to the ER with a panic attack. (laughs) Just saying. Believing in God can trigger the same reward regions of the brain as taking drugs. And this this is something that appeared in Wired that that we're basing our discussion on. Um, It was a, a study out of the University of Utah. Utah is a good place for Jeffrey Anderson, the neuroradiologist who did this study um, to operate in, because when you do studies where you're trying to decide anything, this is just like science 101, you want to try and find the least variability in your subjects so that you can reliably say, we think that what happened is consistent with this population. So if you're going to look for people with a very specific religious mindset um, that, you know, are raised with a similar you know, dogma, for for lack of a better word. I don't mean that in a derogatory fashion, um, but a a similar belief system. Um, He studied 19 young Mormons. And, you know, what what this study found and what a lot of studies have found is that, you know, belief in God and that kind of like, especially like devotional belief in God activates essentially the, the reward system in your brain that is designed to accept pleasure and kind of a sense of accomplishment with a lot of systems. Now, is this system the same as the one that's activated if you're a gambling addict or if you're a drug addict? I'm not going to go so far as to say that God is a drug, but the notion of belief and belonging activating a system, especially if you're in a community of like-minded people, again, let's remember the brain is wired for us to survive and reproduce. Like, that's like literally what it wants us to do. That's what we do. We're animals. We just want to live. We just want to live and seek pleasure, but also avoid pain and danger. And so, you know, group thinking in in many ways uh, has guaranteed, you know, for, for really, I mean, all of primates and many other animals, group thinking, group connectedness, uh, it's safe. You know, I think of lemurs, you know, and how they they patrol for each other. Um, you can even think of like, you know, ant communities and bee communities, you know, ants and bees also group think. It's important. Speaking of patrol for one another, I just saw a uh, 
an explanation of why dogs always want to be with you when you go to the bathroom. You, if you haven't had a dog, you may not know this, but they're often like scratching at the door or like posted up outside the bathroom door. And it turns out that wild dogs and wolves, that's a vulnerable time when you're going to the bathroom. So they protect one another. Mm. They're looking out for one another. Oh, exactly. That's the, that's, that's the right amazing. reaction. Yeah. That's really special and interesting. I've never heard it described that way. I mean, you know, for 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 men, you know, peeing is something they can do standing up, which means that they also can run real fast. You know, for those of us who cannot pee standing up and have to like squat and pull down the thing and get the thing, it's like it's it is a more vulnerable thing if you're hiking or, you know, I mean, that's just like a fact of life, you want to be able to run as a human. You could be eaten <laughs> by a mountain lion. I'm always afraid that something will happen if I'm peeing in the woods. I don't think the people who stand and pee have the same kind of fears. But Jonathan, do you know the most common time for women to naturally go into labor? At night? That's right. At night under kind of like cover of darkness, which sounds scary, but is also in many ways protective because you're not, you know, kind of out in the open. But I was wondering, you know, when when a woman goes into labor, you know, like and if I mean, I'm a person who had a home birth. So like I think of like my cats were there as like a whole thing. But I wonder if people with dogs have this experience of the dog knowing like, oh, they're in a vulnerable place. <laughs> like this lady's going to be dealing with this for a minute. I better stay close by. I'd love to hear from people who had a home birth and have dogs. <laughs> Back to religion for a minute. I've never been deep into organized religion, but recently I got turned on to the religious... It's uh, deep into you. <laughs> recently I got turned on to the religious rock channel on my local radio <laughs> and was introduced to uh, Andrew oh. Ripp who has some feel-good music. And I even shared it with Mayim, who was very hesitant at first, but was like, you know what? This, <laughs> this praise rock really makes you feel good. Well, hang on one second, because I want to go back to this study that actually relates really nicely. So what they did in this study is they, they, they took people who had uh, done missionary work, which I think this is also a, a good population to kind of study, in, because Mormon... Uh, young men and women are sent on on mission to proselytize, which is a different category. But um, they're spending time specifically during mission work. You're you're typically not interacting with your family. I think like like once or twice a year. And this is not false. Like I have extended family and in laws who you know have had these experiences. I'm not just like they can't speak to their families. But you're supposed to spend your time focusing on God and spreading the word. So these are people who have lived presumably pretty devout and connected lives. So what they do is they put them in an MRI machine and they have them, they put goggles on them, you know, because like if you're in an MRI machine, it's usually super dark, right? And that katunk, katunk, that loudness, but you have these goggles and they showed them different videos. And what you had to do is you had to press a button because you can't move a lot in an MRI machine. So it's got to be like a small way to respond. You press a button when you experience heightened spiritual feelings. Mm. So Jonathan, I'm going to read a list of things and I'd like you to visualize them. And if you feel a heightened spiritual feeling, I'd like you to say, ding. All okay. right. Visualization in progress. All right. Okay. So maybe close your eyes. Close your eyes, Jonathan. And I want you to pretend like you're seeing the images of what I'm saying. Let's go. But they were actually showing them the images, right? They were showing them the images. They didn't have to imagine them. But they were showing, uh, they were shown video. Ready? I'm showing you a video on membership and church finances. <laughs> Not feeling it. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you some biblical excerpts. Nope. Still not feeling it. You know where my mind does go, though. Are you thinking about sex? It's going to mess up the study. No. No. <laughs> I mean, if we're going uh, more more optimistic, we're on a like wide open plain, beautiful sky. You know, if if it has to be religious, people are in like white robes, maybe, and it's like the sun is shining. <laughs> there, I'm hopeful. Okay. All done. <laughs> okay, but you're not designing the experiment. So when you design an experiment, I would love to be part of that study. But here's your here's your here's your your third image. 
there's there's some quotes from religious leaders. No, still no. <laughs> still no quotes. Although I'm sure if I showed you some Talmudic excerpts in uh, in like <laughs> on some parchment, your dopamine would go through the roof. Okay, your last image. Here you go. Your last image is an image of people praying. I mean, I think that's potentially more because... I have an association with like a congregation or community in Got prayer it. and in worship and sort of like that vibe of everyone right. sort of singing in unison is very uplifting. So that that one gets me a little bit more. Ah, okay. Okay, so I'm just, and, and look, not all of these images are supposed to, you can open your eyes, not all these images are supposed to evoke heightened spiritual feelings. For example, like I think the church video membership in finances is probably like to see a baseline. Mm. Because what happens in these studies is if you show things and everybody's always activated, you have nothing to compare it to. So that would be like, for me, not a, not a heightened spiritual uh, feeling. But I, I am a person of faith. So I'll be honest, there are certain excerpts from the, to- from the Torah, from the Old Testament, that definitely give me heightened spiritual feelings. These tend to be ones that are more mystical. Um, you know, the prophets have all these like awesome visions, things like that quotes from a variety of religious leaders, it's going to be hard for me just because I'm, you know, Jewish. So it's like a little bit like, you know, if it was rabbis and like people that like I consider my spiritual leaders, I could imagine having heightened spiritual feelings. And I do feel a heightened spiritual sense when I pray. And again, mirror neuron system, if I see other people praying, and yeah, even if they're praying, even if they're a Muslim and praying, or there's something in me that's like, ooh, something happens. Like, I know something happens when I sit with people who are similarly aligned. And so that might get a little heightened spiritual feeling for me. But I get very deeply moved by religious things. Like, put me in a scanner. It's going to be insane. That's why I like going to synagogue. About the quotes, the reason why that would elicit something for you is because you can sort of conjure up a collection of quotes that are meaningful to you. I don't have that, so I just sort of see some words on a scroll and I'm like, oh, they don't do much for me. Okay, I'm going to give one of my favorite quotes. It's not a Bible quote. It's from the Middle Ages, but it's a spiritual leader. The quote is, uh, for the intellect is the glory of God. The reason this makes me feel a heightened sense of spirituality is there's no gender in it to make my brain be like, mm, God's not a he. And it's celebrating an aspect of me that I, I was not really aware before I learned of this kind of, you know, aspect of philosophy that like your intellect is special. It's divine. Thinking about things, pondering, philosophizing, like that makes me feel really excited. So like that's a quote that other people would be like, oh, that's nice. Also, shout out to Maimonides. That's whose quote it is, the Rambam. Um, but I mean, I, I think that for me, like when I feel a sense of like ecstatic excitement about I'm a spiritual being, like I exist on this planet. Um, yeah, it's a thing that that fills me up. It fills me up in a way that I do think is like that's that reward circuit, not just because God told me to do this and I'm following the rules because I don't always follow the rules. Like the rules are oftentimes made up by like dudes from, you know, 2000 years ago. But um, yeah, I do. I, I get something just from the experience itself and not just being like, I'm a good Christian or I'm a good, you know, Jew and I follow the rules. Like for me, it is more of a mystical experience separate from obedience. I'm fascinated to do a comparison study between the impact and the influence of religious belief on the brain and exercise and running. People get that runner's high. People get that euphoria from physical movement and exertion. I wonder how those two compare. 100%. 100%. And if you're running while praying and, you know, being in a devoted state. What is that going to do for you? Whew, sorry. I just, I just got chills. If everyone wants to know, I just got, um, I just got chills. So I'm going to cry because this is what happens. So Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, um, was, um, a, a friend and colleague of, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He's the rabbi that you see marching alongside Dr. King. And when he was asked, you know, what, what happened? that day that they marched, you know, he said, I prayed with my feet. Mm. And Heschel's daughter 
uh, quotes him as saying that he prayed for freedom for 20 years and received no answer until he prayed with his legs. Mm. And it's very interesting because, you know, so much of the civil rights movement, which was, I mean, religiously, you know, inspired, meaning the a lot of the the liturgy that was used to motivate people and the notion of like God created all of us literally equal. <laughs> like literally, that means you have to actually make the Constitution apply. Um, that notion of collective movement as prayer was a huge component of um of the civil rights movement. So I think that's a very interesting comparison that you just made. But I do also want to give a shout out to what you said about music. You know, the the connection that we have with music is itself a spiritual experience, separate from any belief in God. So for me and for you, you're not an organized religion person, but you are a deeply, a deeply connected person with I believe something that is divine. And I've really like I so resonate with like Christian music like you and I have started listening to because I I know that that Jesus is not for me that's not my choice it's not my path uh but the notion of like love and devotion and feeling safe in someone else's power like that's I feel safe with gravity like for me that's really it's lovely I'm super into it um Jonathan I have to say that I like talking about anything and everything with you. But I do really enjoy talking about science and the brain and especially positive news stories around all the incredible things that our brains can experience and also ways that they can be modified and bettered both with drugs and without. I really appreciate when science catches up to uh, all the thing that, all the things that the hippies have been saying <laughs> for years. So uh, it's great to see that these studies are um, bringing to light and uh, validating a lot of what people have been talking about for years. So very exciting. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this Thursday episode. Uh, we missed you so much in between Tuesday releases. We just can't help but uh, show up Thursday sometimes. Mayim, thank you for explaining this stuff to us. And, you know, I just want to say that a news story that didn't make it into this episode, which has to make it into a later one, is that there's a dinosaur that they discovered that has things on his head that looked like he had a toothbrush on his head. So if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to stay tuned for more positive news stories for great stories like that. From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have, we'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. 